How are you guys doing? It's good to be with you guys. Um, I'm excited as well. Just want, as, as Pastor Cody said, uh, we are in a week of fasting, and I don't, I don't know what that has looked like for you, um, but I can totally agree and, and say what a beautiful thing it is to, to say, God, you are more important than something in my life. Um, and the beautiful thing about it is sometimes we don't know how important something is until we give it up, right? You're like, whoa, this thing's actually closer to my heart or has my affection or attention more than I realized when I tried to give it up. And I was like, find myself reaching for that thing again. So um, if you are in that boat of, of saying, Lord, I'm consecrating myself, you know, in faith that you are going to do something that you haven't done yet. Um, I pray also that not only are you focusing on the withstanding, but you're also focusing on the delighting in the Lord as well. Um, yeah, he's not wanting us just to hold our will until we get through the seven days. I think there's so much more in the faith of recognizing this delight to be found in um, recognizing him as well. Uh, I just want to honor our pastors in the front here. Uh, Cody and Chantel, I, I agree. When he said um, we were in their lounge room a few years ago, um, the hospi- hospitality that you showed by opening your home then has um, continued to now opening your home for many other people. And I can attest um, for you guys, uh, I feel like Laura and, and I have seen you guys in many different lights, in many different scenarios, uh, leaders that are willing to go low uh, before God, be humble. And yeah, thank you for the opportunity as well to come and speak. Um, yeah, so honor you guys. I also pray that what I would have um, to share today would, would bless you guys as well, um, as it has blessed me to actually go away with the Lord and, and seek Him. Um, so the thing that I want to talk about today, um, so who was here, hands up, if you were at baptisms two weeks, two, two three weeks ago when we had, had baptisms, who thought it was such a beautiful thing. It is such a beautiful thing to see people uh, make that public confession of the old has come, the new, uh, the old has gone, the new has come. Um, Did anyone get baptized uh, that's in the room? Yeah, there was a few in the 9 a.m. Yes, Sabrina's here. Um, What a beautiful thing it is. Um, I was not there on that Sunday. Um, A little joke that we have with our group of friends uh, from Tribes Run Club is when you run a marathon, you look for every opportunity to tell people that you run a marathon. Um, You insert it in every conversation. You know, they might be like, what are you having for lunch? And I'll be like, oh, you know, I'm not eating that because I'm running marathons, you know. So um, I was running a marathon on that Sunday morning, the Perth Marathon. Um, Yeah, why not? Give it up for me. Why not? Why not? Just... (laughs) I got my medal in the car if you want to come see it, take photos with it, like whatever you need, guys, to say that you were part of the the marathon running. But no, I wasn't there on on this last Sunday when we did baptisms, but it is my favorite Sundays uh, to see that um, that public confession of faith. Um, And, and, you know, it was a reminder me, Ephesians 2, it describes that we were dead in our transgressions and sins. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace that we have been saved. The main text that I want to talk about today is in Romans chapter 12, verse 9 and 11. It's called Love in Action. It says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Let me just highlight those different parts. Love must be sincere, must hate what is evil, must cling to what is good. Devotion to one another, honoring one another above ourselves, never lacking in zeal, but keeping our spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Now, I've been walking with the Lord for most of my adult life, and one of my favorite things to do is to watch a totally unsaved and unchurched person give their life to Jesus. Um, it's, it's like, if, if you've been around the church for a little, little while, it's like this beautiful um, display of this person coming to say yes to Jesus, but also they don't know anything about it as well. They don't know where to sit. They don't know where how to raise their hands. They don't know the cultural norms. Um, and it's this beautiful thing. I think this beautiful rubbing of the shoulders of, of watching someone that's just wanting to say yes to Jesus. Jesus. I don't know what it looks like, but I'm willing to walk it out. Um, it reminds me of Zacchaeus uh, in the Bible, the tax collector story. When Jesus is invited in and through his encounter with Jesus, he recognizes his deceit and not only gives everything back, but, but he gives back four times the amount. 
this unbridled zeal to be all in. Their hands go up when it's time to serve. They're like, yeah, I don't know anything about production, but I'll, I'll do it. Uh, I don't even know what production is or who's the leader, but I'll do it. It's this thing of unbridled zeal. And I love it because it's a good shakeup for me as a believer to examine myself. And often it can be those times that I am challenged to ask myself, am I growing in my love for God? Am I lacking in this zeal that Paul talks about that we are never to be out of? You see, the mature side of me wants to have those thoughts like, oh, they just don't get it yet. You know, they'll, they'll settle down, give them a few months, they'll, they'll find their spot in the church, that, 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 that honeymoon phase of, of becoming a new believer will be over. But today I want to make the case that have we, bec- have we placed an overemphasis on being dead to sin, that we are missing what it also means to be alive in Christ? <laughs> have we placed the overemphasis on doing the right thing? but missing the principle of what attitude do we do it in? You know, um, Jeff's, Jeff Carter spoke last week about this idea of a rain jacket in the desert. Anyone remember that? The beautiful picture. For me, even in prep this week, I was thinking about that picture. Um, and something that I want to talk about is, yes, we can be ones that can have the rain jacket in the desert, but what is our posture like? What is our attitude like? And that's what I really want to talk about this word zeal. Everybody say zeal. <laughs> you know, um, as Pastor Cody also said, so we have three children, both Laura and I, and one on the way. Um, and something that we have tried to do and instill as parents um, in raising young children is to teach them how to obey, teach them how to, how to, how to listen to what their parents are saying. Um, and one of the things that we would say um, in trying to instill with them, not only is there a way to obey, but how we can do it in a godly way is, and you can test my kids, so they're in little tribes right now and um, one's in the belly, but you can ask them, the question that we ask our kids if we're saying, hey, can you help us with something? Or if you can go clean your room. Uh, if there's a little bit of attitude, the question that we always ask is, Sailor or Malia, how do we obey? Uh, and the answer is, they say, all the way. Everyone say, all the way. All the way. Right away. Right. And with a happy heart. <laughs> all the way, right away, and with a happy heart. Seems a little bit elementary. They are small kids. But it's this understanding that we don't want them to just obey just out of duty, but in the attitude as well. It's this thing of joyful obedience. You know, in this short time with you, I hope to show you the biblical attitude that we as ones who are dead to sin and alive in Christ, the ones with the new nature are to walk out this journey. Uh, This week I did a deep dive. Uh, I have so much more love and respect for my pastor uh, to recognize what it means to bring a word of God for for, for his people every single week. Um, Laura can attest, there was many... uh, Many early mornings and late nights. Um, I actually ended up writing four different sermons for this week. Um, the other three were terrible. Trust me, don't worry about them. No. <laughs> uh, but I wrote, I wrote four different sermons for this weekend, and it was Friday night, Saturday. I was sitting with Laura. I was like, Laura, I don't know which which direction to go to. What would be the thing that the Lord would have? Um, but I stumbled on this this topic of revival. I wrote a sermon on, on, on revival. Um, and many of you would know next week is our conference. And it's called, everyone say, Tent Revival. Tent Revival. Uh, so I began to do a deep dive on what revival is, what it kind of looks like. And I came across uh, a revivalist named Jonathan Edwards. Um, and at the age of 19, he wrote 70 resolutions as a young man after God, before his arrival, uh, before the revival of the Great Awakening that is, he is attributed to. Uh, he wrote 70 resolutions, 70 things that are saying, this is what I'm going to be about. This is the attitude that I'm going to carry. This is the way that I'm going to carry it out. Number six resolution is, I have resolved to live with all my might while I do live. I'm just going to read that again. It's a simple phrase, but I have resolved to live with all my might while I do live. You know, Jonathan Edwards has this disposition towards living with fervor and passion. You know, Romans chapter 12, verse 11, another version of it says, Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Instead of that word fervent, some translations say that you should be aglow. It means that you should boil. We get the word fervent from from the Latin word for vens, which means to boil. If you're a fervent person, your spirit is alive. It's quickened. It's boiling for something. Are we boiling for the Lord today? You know, A.W. Tozer says, what we think about when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So let me ask you, in the space of worship, which we just had the beautiful team lead us, 
What kind of mood do you think God is in when we're in worship? What kind of mood? Do you think he's like that kind of halfway worship space there? Do you think he's kind of like, oh, that's not my favorite song? You think he's like, oh, Ben Stafford just sang an original. Doesn't he know we don't know the words to his original? What kind of mood do you think God is in in the place of worship? You know, if we don't see God as joyful and zealous, then by default, the more joyful and zealous we become, the less like him we become. Zeal is our way forward, point number one. Jonathan Edwards says, God gets the glory by being known and enjoyed. God gets no glory from people who do not enjoy him. If God is not great enough in our life and more enjoyable than the lunch that we are about to have, or if you're fasting the lunch that you're not about to have, or your favorite hobby, then I would argue that we don't know God in the way that he would be inviting us. God is not just to be known with the mind. He is to be delighted in and savored. He is to be seen and savored. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm chapter 34, verse 8. Delight yourself in the Lord. Psalm 37, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord. And I again, again I say, rejoice. Rain Molly knows it. If we don't do that, we are missing a vital part of the Christian life and do not bring him the glory that he deserves. How we need a generation of people that are passionate and fervent for the Lord, yeah? Now you may be thinking, I am following him. Isn't this enough? Now you're telling me you have to have zeal, passion, joy in my faith as well. Well, look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 47 and 48. Now, you know, in the book of Deuteronomy, the Lord's not playing around, you know, he just says it straight. You got to love it. It says, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you. Let me just read that again because I think it's hilarious. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you. You know, that's serious. Joy is a serious issue. And it may sound a little harsh, but I would argue it's because it's God's will and God's way that he is about. God's will and God's way. They go hand in hand. We look in Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. Jesus said to the church in Laodicea, Because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. God is not into moderate. He's not into middle of the road devotion to Jesus. Zeal is important. Caring deeply about God, not moderately caring about God is important. Let me ask you, Tribe Church, again, are you alive in Christ today? Number two is zeal is our strength. You know, Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. In Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10, the day is holy to our God. Do not grieve for the Lord, for the, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understand the words that have been made known to them. Let me ask you, what kind of noises ring from your house in your neighborhood? Are they ones of celebration? Are we known as the people that know how to throw the best parties? Are we known as the people that have this unspeakable joy that is beyond, beyond this earth? Or are we not? You know, we're in this time right now where, where I think it's so easy, right, to just be like, oh, I just need to come in. I just need to relax a little bit. I need to calm down. But as I look into these scriptures, it's seeing, uh, it shows us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Our joy will not be perfect in this life. We will always have moments of strain, always have moments of struggle. We will, not have our, we will have our angst and anxieties. We will have our ups and downs. Not only is true joy coming, but even now we sample the sweetness, especially in suffering. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is, inex- that is inexpressible and filled with glory. It's this unique perspective on joy. It's an attitude that God's people adopt, not because of our circumstances, but because of our hope in God's love and promise. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with joy. 
So it's this understanding that we aren't joyful and zealous because we have lost touch with reality or we are downplaying the hardships in our life. But rather, it's though we don't see him, we believe in him. And for that reason, we can rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Psalm 51 verse 12, Lord, would you restore unto me the joy of my salvation? The rest of that verse says, restore uh, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. You know, it's the joy and a willing spirit that will sustain us. Uh, but rather, I would think of it as this, as Dallas Willard um, quotes. He says, how many people are radically and permanently repelled from the way by Christians who are unfeeling, stiff, unapproachable, boringly lifeless, obsessive and dissatisfied. Yet such Christians are everywhere. And what they are missing, so it gets good, it gets good, okay? You're like, is is he talking about me specifically? (laughs) He's like, how did he know? No, but it says, but what they are missing is the wholesome liveliness springing from a balanced vitality with the freedom of God's loving rule. You know, we know this question all the time. We say, oh, are you saved? Are you a Christian? Are you saved? The, the thing, the outside of that question is like, what are you saved from? And does it look like you're saved from that thing? You know, or are we, are we more like hanging on to this thing and like, yeah, I'm saved from that, but I'm still like kind of looking over that way a little bit. No, we're missing this thing of that, that Willa talks about, yet such Christians are everywhere. It says, we are missing the wholesome liveliness springing from a balanced vitality with the freedom of God's loving rule. We are dead to sin, alive in Christ. It's the Westminster Confession that says, the chief end to man's purpose is to worship God and enjoy Him forever. Can we say that we enjoy His presence? You know, as a worship leader, you might feel like, oh, he has to say that, definitely. Uh, But something that really convicted me a few years ago was I was listening to a teaching on worship, and the pastor said, you know, if you don't enjoy worship here, you're really going to have a hard time in heaven, because like... That's all they're doing. And that was a little bit of a, a, little bit of a conviction for me as, as a worship leader. I was like, okay, well, if there's something to be enjoyed and something to maybe press in for, to learn how to enjoy him, then, then let me go for it. Uh, we aren't going to win people over to Christ by only focusing on the dead to sin and denying the flesh. They need to see that we're alive in Christ. Can I just say that again? Because as I even read, I was like, oh, that's pretty good. We aren't going to win people over to Christ by only focusing on the dead to sin and denying the flesh. They also need to see that you are alive in Christ. You know, there's a story of Blaise Pascal. Now, we're, we haven't got a name for baby number four yet, but in about three weeks, baby number four is about to come. Uh, so I was reading the story of, about Blaise Pascal, and I was like, Who thinks Blaise Pascal Mangella sounds pretty good? (laughs) Not bad, right? We're not French, but we can uh, can adopt it. We can adopt it. Uh, But the story of Blaise Pascal, born in central France in 1623. Pascal was a prodigy who by the age of 10 was experimenting in mathematics and science. Um, So he was a, basically he was a genius. Pascal's a belief Beliefs acquired a new enthusiasm for Jesus at 1654. And from then on, he became less involved in science and mathematics and more interested in faith and philosophy. You know, basically, he he came to this encounter with Christ in 1654 where he's like, what I've just experienced right now, I need to go after that. I need, to, I need to push aside mathematics and all these things that I'm known for as a boy genius, and I'm going to go after the Lord. When Pascal died, a piece of paper had been kept hidden in his coat jacket. Uh, and, and someone found this, this piece of paper that was sewn into his jacket. Uh, the document was the memorial, is a testimony of Blaise Pascal. You know, I'm just going to read just one or two lines from this testimony that had been sewn into his jacket. No one else knew about it. It says, Righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. It says here, joy, 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 tears of joy. Um, It says down even more, uh, "Let, let me never be separated from him. He is only kept securely by the ways taught in the gospel. It says, complete submission to Jesus. You know, as I, as I begin to think about that, if there was a letter that was sewn into our jackets today, what would it say of the testimony of Jesus? Would it be, 
Joy, 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 I have found delight in him. Or would it be maybe, oh man, sometimes I kind of feel Jesus a little bit. Would it be like, oh, I kind of like worshiping a little bit. Would it be like, oh, I'm just trying to make it through to the pearly gates. Just let me get through there and then I can say, Jesus, I did it all for you. What would our letter of our heart be? You know, they say that the, the letter that was sewn into a jacket over his heart was uh, his kind of symbolism of saying, I'm going to preach my testimony to myself daily. I'm not going to allow myself to, to, to settle down or to get a bit more mature and, and relax about this thing called Jesus. But no, I never want to let anything hinder zeal. Three things that hinder zeal. Uh, if you want to put that up, Mr. Drew. Um, Psalm 32 verse 5. It says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped. And in the heat of summer, then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. You know, when we're holding on to sin and we're not confessing it, which the scripture is talking about, and I think we can all attest how weak we feel, yeah? How, how timid we feel in the presence of God. I wouldn't say that when we're holding on to things um, that we know are not right before the Lord, would we say, oh, it's just so easy to jump into His presence, so easy to show these things of zeal and joy. No, I think sometimes we're a bit holding back. We're like, oh, if only they knew. Or, or I know that I'm not right before God. You know, that this this thing that people would always say, and I grew up around a lot of non-believers, and they would say, man, the church would fall, the walls would cave in if I walked through the, through the church doors. Has anyone heard something like that, maybe from your friends? Um, it was just this thing of like, if only they knew. And sometimes when we're holding on to these things, yeah, it can feel like we're a bit timid before God. But I just want to remind us from Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, is the joy of the Lord that strengthens us. If it's sin, the thing that, that weakens us and, and keeps us timid, then it's the joy that strengthens us. Psalm chapter 85, verse 6, Lord, will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? So it's this beautiful picture that I love that, guys, it's not only will God want to heal, not only does God want to forgive, not only does God want to do this, but the, 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 the outworking of that is rejoice. The outworking of that is zeal. The outworking of that is passion for Him. You know, when I think about the conversion from, from Saul to Paul, all that zeal that had he had going into persecu persecuting Christians and doing this and doing that, that zeal he grabbed onto when he was converted and he put it into work of the Lord. And today we are reading His words. Sometimes we can feel as believers are like, oh, I had all this passion, I had this joy, now I need to just hold on to it. I don't know what to do with it. Bring it to Jesus. Bring it to the house. Um, point number two, distraction or indifference. You know, the parable of the wedding banquet in Matthew chapter 22. It says, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. It's kind of hard to read this when you're fasting, right? Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed them. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people that they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. You know, it's this understanding. You see here, when they were giving their reason for why they can't come and feast with the king, it wasn't these crazy excuses. It was like, oh, I need to go back to my field. Oh, I need to get back to, my, to, to, to what I'm doing. And sometimes I believe in our lives, it's the little things in life. It's the normal things of life that can distract us from learning to have zeal and delight in Him. And point number three is reasonableness. You know, there's a book called The Power of Moments. Uh, and one of the quotes from that book, it says, Beware of the soul-sucking force of reasonableness. Don't you love that quote? Does anyone want to get that tattooed on them maybe? Beware of the soul-sucking force of reasonableness. 
You know, it was the reasonableness of the disciples that tried to hinder the woman washing Jesus' feet. It was the reasonableness of Michael that and wanted to hinder the undignified worship of her husband David before the Lord. Stoicism isn't a sign of a mature believer. You know, you might be thinking, okay, I have this passion. What do I do with it? What does it look like? Three things that I believe that we as believers are to have zeal and passion for. Zeal for the house. John chapter 2 verse 17 says, zeal for your house will consume me, Lord. Do we have a passion for his house? Do we have a zeal for the lost? 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 3 and 4, he desires that all would be saved. Do we have that? Does that, does that bother us? Um, now, both my wife and I, we, we spent a long time, and our 20s was uh, dedicated to missions uh, in, in Youth for the Mission. And um, someone that I could say really taught me what it means to have a zeal for the lost was her. Um, we went to countries like India, and I would be walking, and it'd be our day off. And often we know the Lord can move on our days off in, our, in those different inconvenient moments, if you want to call it that. And I'll be walking past um, a homeless person, maybe on the street, and her first thought is like, let's go get a bucket, and, and let's begin to like minister to this man. I just remember watching, again, as a husband, I'm definitely always a bit behind her on the maturity of spiritual maturity stage. And she's like talking to this man down with him. You know, what does he need? Can, can I get you food? Do we have a zeal for the lost? Do we have a zeal for the things that the Lord loves? Number three, do we have zeal for the Lord? You know, Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. You know, we aren't going to win this world to Jesus through being serious. We aren't going to attract the world to the things of God through our stoicism. We aren't talking about this fake it to make it type of happiness. I'm talking about deep understanding that I've been given, given a new nature. We are new creations in Christ. The old me doesn't have the same hold. This isn't a personality thing. This isn't, oh, that's just those people over there, or they're they're just from that country, or they're just always optimistic, I don't know why. This isn't a personality thing. As I look in the Scriptures, no one gets a pass on zeal. This is a necessity for the believer. Our personalities may be all over the place, but nobody gets a pass on zeal. Those of us that know ourselves are learning to be honest with reality. The beautiful thing is it doesn't all fall on us. Lord, would you restore to me the joy of your salvation? It is good news that the joy doesn't fall on us, but the almighty shoulders of God himself. You know, we can desire revival. And as I was looking through this week and studying and asking the Lord what he would be having, The question that I have for us today, but when it shows up, will our present wineskin allow for the fresh outpouring? I don't want to be, as 2 Timothy 3 verse 5 says, have a form of godliness, but deny its power. My question for us today, do we have the power of Christ in us? Are we alive in Christ? Can we say that we actually have a zeal for the things of Him? Can we say that we have a zeal for the house? Can we say we have a zeal for the lost? Can we say that we have a zeal for the Lord? You know, in today's call is for those who can recognize that maybe there isn't that joy that we once had. You know, maybe you've been a believer for many years and you're like, I know how this kind of goes and how how the outworkings of the Christian walk is. But my encouragement will be for us today. Can we recognize that there is something for us? That there, there is a revived zeal that the Lord wants to give us. Lord, give me a revived zeal for you. God, would you restore unto me the joy of my salvation? And I really believe that. As Pastor Cody comes up, and he's going to lead us in our ministry time. I really believe the Lord wants to revive on us. Revival in our hearts before revival anywhere else. Amen. Revival in our church before anywhere else. And, 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 you know, we don't want to see it out there and not see it in here. 
But Lord, would you revive in us a love for you? Would you revive in us a zeal for you? And Pastor God, I'm just going to call you if you want to lead this ministry space. The invitation for the Lord to come and meet us. Maybe we know we're a little bit dry or maybe we know we're a little bit indifferent. Maybe we know we're holding on to things that have hindered us from going to Him boldly and with confidence. Lord, I just want to pray today. Lord, we say your way is better. Your voice is better. Would you teach us how to enjoy your presence if we are not? Would you teach us how to love your presence? Would you teach us how to love the things that you love? Lord, we say we want passion in the house. We want passion in our hearts. We want zeal for the things of you today. Would you lead us today?